ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ನನ್ನ ಹೆಸರು ಮೈಥಿಲಿ ಅಂತ ನಾನು ಟಾಟಾ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೋಷಿಯಲ್ ಸೈನ್ಸ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಡಯಟ್ ಪ್ರಾಂಶುಪಾಲರು ಮತ್ತೆ ಉಪನ್ಯಾಸರಿಗೆ ಶುಭ ದಿನಗಳು ಇವತ್ತಿಂದು ಹಿಂದೆ ಕಳೆದ ಮೂರು ಸೆಷನ್ ಇಂದ ನಾವು ಈ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ನ ಕಂಡಕ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀವಿ ಒಟ್ಟು ಆರು ಟಾಪಿಕ್ಸ್ ನ ಆಯ್ಕೆ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಂಡಿದ್ದೀವಿ ಕಳೆದ ಮೂರು ಟಾಪಿಕ್ಸ್ ಜನರಲ್ ಆಗಿತ್ತು ಸೊ ಮೊದಲನೇ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಆನ್ಲೈನ್ ಸೆಷನ್ಸ್ ಹೇಗೆ ಕಂಡಕ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡೋದು ಮತ್ತೆ ಒ ಇ ಆರ್ ಬಳಕೆ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ಕೊಟ್ಟಿತ್ತು ಸಾಕಷ್ಟು ನಿಮ್ಗೆಲ್ಲ ಗೊತ್ತಿರೋಂಗೆ ಈಗ ಸಂಪನ್ಮೂಲಗಳಿದೆ ಓಪನ್ ಸೋರ್ಸ್ ಅಲ್ಲೇ ಇದೆ ಸೊ ಡಿ ಎಸ್ ಇಆರ್ ಟಿ ವೆಬ್ಸೈಟ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಇರುವಂತಹ ಸಂಪನ್ಮೂಲಗಳನ್ನ ನಾವು ಉದಾಹರಣೆ ತಗೊಂಡು ಮೊದಲನೇ ಸೆಷನ್ ನ ಕಂಡಕ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ವಿ ಎರಡನೇ ಸೆಷನ್ ಇನ್ಕ್ಲೂಸಿವ್ ಎಜುಕೇಶನ್ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಇತ್ತು ಅದಕ್ಕ ಯುನಿಸೆಫ್ ಫಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಮತ್ತೆ ಡಿ ಎಸ್ ಇಆರ್ ಟಿ ಕೊಲಾಬರೇಷನ್ ಜೊತೆ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದು ಒಂದಷ್ಟು ರಿಸೋರ್ಸಸ್ ನ ಪರಿಚಯ ಮಾಡಿ ಕೊಟ್ಟಿತ್ತು ಎರಡನೇ ಸೆಷನ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಮೂರನೇ ಸೆಷನ್ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಇತ್ತು ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ಕೊಟ್ಟಿತ್ತು ಕಳೆದ ಸೆಷನ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಇವತ್ತಿನ ದಿನ ನಾವು ಇನ್ನೊಂದ್ ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಸ್ಪೆಸಿಫಿಕ್ ಆಗಿ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಮತ್ತೆ ಕಲಿಕೆ ಕಡೆ ಗಮನ ಕೊಡೋಣ ಅಂತ ಶುರು ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಂಡಿದ್ದೀವಿ ಅಹ್ ಇವತ್ತು ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಇಂದಿರಾ ವಿಜಯ ಸಿಂಹ ನಮ್ ಜೊತೆಗೆ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಅವರು ಬಹಳ ಅನುಭವಿಸ್ತರು ಅಹ್ ಅಜೀಮ್ ಪ್ರೇಮ್ಜಿ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿನಲ್ಲಿ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಆಗಿ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಮತ್ತೆ ಶಾಲೆನು ನಡೆಸ್ತಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅವ್ರಿಗೆ ಅವ್ರ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೀರಿಯನ್ಸ್ ವೈಡ್ ರೇಂಜಿಂಗ್ ಆಗಿದೆ ವಿ ಆರ್ ರಿಯಲಿ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ದಟ್ ಯು ಆಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟೆಡ್ ಅವರ್ ಇನ್ವಿಟೇಷನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಕಂಡಕ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಟುಡೆ ಇಂದಿರಾ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ವೆರಿ ಮಚ್ ಓವರ್ ಟು ಯು thank you maithili for the kind uh, introduction and also for inviting me to give this uh, webinar ellarigo namaskara daivittu kshamisi idu solpa technical topic iruvaga i will present it in english i will try to go slow and any time you have questions you can type it in the chat box i have two specific spaces in the session when we i share the session plan you can see that right um so welcome once again uh, today's topic is uh, as i was given it is knowledge as constructed in social context i would like to clarify perhaps you may think of it is how learners or students construct knowledge in social context because all the time as human beings we are in social context so with that shall we move to the next slide yeah so the objectives so we will take a very brief overview of the psychology of learning this uh, webinar is basically dealing with the psychological and cognitive processes involved in learning and we will see a little bit of other uh, ideas and theories about learning and then we will talk about the constructivist uh, ideas or constructivist approach to understand how learners come to know something that is the second and the third part of the seminar we will draw out implications for pedagogy and curriculum based on the constructive perspective incidentally the national curriculum framework 2005 has adopted a constructivist framework the next slide will tell you about the session plan right so that is the session plan. all right we'll move to the next slide please thank you so one of the earliest and for us uh, in india uh, those who have been in the teacher education field or in the teaching field we are very familiar 
with behaviorism and uh, a lot of the uh, terms and concepts from behaviorism are still uh, being used are continued to be and we are used to hearing many of these terms we hear words like motivation reinforcement uh, prerequisites competency skill all these are concepts or uh, terms that are associated with the behaviorism or with the behavioristic uh, theories of learning now basically in this approach uh, we are on i mean the focus is on the external behavior the idea is we cannot know what is going on inside the mind of the learner and therefore we only focus on the external behavior that is the broad idea and this uh, theory is what is behind you know when we make the curriculum very structured and systematic where the content area is organized in a hierarchy from simple to uh, complex everything is pre-planned and i'm not saying this is a bad thing but, but the understanding is that the knowledge can be broken down into smaller and smaller and smaller bits and each bit when it is learned is supposed to uh, result in a particular kind of behavioral outcome so these are often called as skills and sub skills whether it is reading or mathematics we are quite familiar with this kind of approach to learning and in this approach progress is assessed by measuring observable behavioral outcomes and is supposed to take place linearly so stage by stage the child is supposed to uh, master the skills and uh, go to the next stage uh, benjamin bloom again uh, very familiar to many of us uh, who gave us the taxonomy of learning objectives is basically drawing from a uh, behavioristic model of learning and um, so if you break up the entire you know whatever has to be learned is broken up into small 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 bits and uh, at each stage the outcome is expected there is an expected outcome if the learner is not able to you know uh, meet that requirement you again teach the learner till the learner has mastered it and produces the required outcome and then goes to the next stage and so on and the assumption is if the learner crosses all the stage linearly then he has learned the whole concept um, that was that is the assumption in in the behavioristic uh, kind of model some other names you might be already familiar i deliberately did not uh, introduce too many names in the uh, I, in fact i have almost avoided putting any names in the uh, slides but we may know about the reward and punishment uh, which uh, methods which uh, is associated with skinner's uh, experiments and so on and so forth and every day when you go into the classroom or even in the corporate world people will be talking of motivation how do you motivate and in all these cases the motivation is external so what is it that you do to get certain desired behavior and this desired behavior is not uh, defined by the learner but by whoever is planning the uh the learning right like as teachers we expect what should be the outcome and we are all so comfortable with this that we don't even stop to think what are the assumptions and uh you know uh, limitations of this kind of approach to learning so the next slide um can i have the next slide please yeah so the next slide uh, i just give you uh, briefly so these are the assumptions behind behaviorism and two key assumptions i have said i have not gone into great details so the first one is that knowledge can be broken down into learnable skills which is what i had said already so anything knowledge is something which is considered to be outside the learner right knowledge is out there in the form of codified or you know accepted 
ways of understanding things. And whatever that learner has to learn, that knowledge, it can be learned in small, small bits from simple to complex. There is an assumption about learner also in this. So the learner is largely considered to be passive, someone who can be motivated externally by various things that we do. Uh, so in, in B. Ed, we would have taught our students do voice modulation, introduce uh, humor, uh, you know, um, and so on and so forth. Give reward and to, you know, encourage um, behavior that you want, positive reinforcement. All these concepts are associated with this approach to learning. Uh, you may be wondering, so why do we have to go for any other approach? Well, there are many reasons, but one broad limitation is this approach does not explain how change in understanding or to put it in another way, how cognitive change takes place, right? It is not going inside the mind of the learner. You may be wondering, is it possible to go inside the mind of the learner? Well, uh, much later, uh, work of Piaget and others have shown, it is quite possible to go inside the mind of the learner and try to understand how understanding takes place. So actually these theories are all trying to understand understanding or knowing. So it is actually all these are at some in some ways meta level understanding about how we come to know something, right? So behaviorism is saying that the mind is a black box. Only what we can see outside, it we can deal with. Now I'll give you an example and the limitation will become very clear, right? Two children are there in the class and they, you know, uh, do the same action, right? And can you say that they are doing it for the same reason? You cannot say. One may be doing it to, you know, say someone, uh, you know, is I, any example you can think of. We know from, you know, everyday observation and interactions with children that though, though they may do the same thing, the reasons why they do it could be quite different. And that is something that behaviorism cannot explain because it is not dealing with what is going on inside the mind of the learner. All right. So that is one, but this is one major uh, approach to learning that has been around in education for many years. As I've said, we still find all sorts of, uh, you know, approaches based on behaviorism very much prevalent in education, even to this day. Uh, the next approach to learning is called maturationism. Uh, maturation, as you know, is a development or developmental stage. Now, when it comes to learning, uh, according to maturationism, conceptual knowledge is dependent on development stage of the learner. That is, uh, the way a baby has some idea about the world around us is because the baby's brain and body are not yet mature. When they mature to say, when the baby becomes a toddler, when the infant becomes a toddler, then some level of maturation has occurred both in the brain and the body. And now the toddler is able to understand the world a little better. And when the toddler becomes a child, um, then, or a young child, what we call as a primary a state child, then again, so some further maturation has taken place. And now the child is capable of some other kinds of conceptual understanding. That is the broad idea of this theory. So every stage is dependent on maturation, biological maturation, actually. And uh, people have... Uh, uh, famous names associated with this could be Eric Erickson, who has talked about the concept of self as it develops as a child uh, matures. And he has uh, given a lot of 
uh, writing about how this happens and so on and so forth. People have applied it to other areas, to learning areas also. So there are stages of growth and development and characteristic behaviors associated with each stage. Even today, I mean, this is to some extent obvious, but the question is, we'll come to why there might be some limitations to this approach, right? We all know that what a infant can do is, and what a toddler can do are quite different. On the more tingledu magu, matte on the hadanent tingledu magu nalli, tumba vitya sagale karne ke barute. So they are, and uh, even uh, psychologists are concerned. So we talk of developmental milestones. E milestones, uh, miligalli. Uh, e milestones achieve agitre, our development normal range agitre. Uh, ide anta. Id, all doctors have these charts. Um, even psychologists have these charts. So also developmental stages are hierarchical. One dad mele one do. sequence agi hokta ide. So, and curriculum is therefore planned to be developmentally appropriate. Uh, it seems a bit obvious, uh, although Bruner is one of the people who has questioned it. So it seems obvious that we will not introduce the idea of logarithms in class one. In class one, we are just introducing number concept. So the, it seems that they are not yet ready to I understand about logarithms. So in, in Western literature, there is a lot of literature which is concerned, which is called readiness. Is the child ready to do this? Is the child ready to learn this? So there is that kind of understanding as if there is a, and uh, uh, very often, and even in my own beard textbook, Piaget's theory was also presented as if it is a maturationist theory. Actually, Piaget's idea of stage uh, pre-operational concrete operations formal operations etc etc is not really a maturation theory because he is not he what piaget is trying to do or was trying to do is explain how thinking develops and therefore it is not right to think of piaget's ideas in terms of uh, maturation or stages he himself, towards the end of his uh, lifetime, after about 50 years of research, has written that it is not a maturation theory. Maybe he had, he also corrected some of his earlier ideas. Uh, the next slide, please. So again, um, as a, I would say as an improvement on the behavioral theory, in this approach to education, learners are viewed as active meaning makers. That is, learners are themselves trying to make sense of the world. So that is an improvement upon the behavioristic idea of the learner. Uh, learners are also interpreting. Interpreting, Andre, they are trying to understand what is, when they have an experience, what is happened, why it has happened, how it has happened, will it happen again, and so on and so forth, with cognitive structures. Cognitive structures are mental structures. We are uh, still not sure whether there are physical or neurological structure, actually brain structures that match with cognitive structures. So we don't know. Co we can think of cognitive structures as software, right? And the brain as hardware. So uh, the software may not have an exact, you know, uh, match in the hardware. So that is how we have to think of cognitive structures as software. Hmm. But in maturation, they think that the cognitive structures themselves are a result of maturation. Somehow by maturation, a new cognitive structure comes. Like if you have, instead of DOS operation, now you do some other MS. Uh, Microsoft operating system comes. How it happens, maturation is not telling us. This theory is not telling us. It is also assuming that age-related norms for cognitive, uh, sorry, age, yeah, age-related norms for cognition can be described. There's a mistake in that sentence. That means uh, 
for one particular age, what can be expected? This is what uh, maturation is telling. So you will have teachers also, you know, uh, either intuitively or through some understanding, teachers will tell you. Uh, at class one, they cannot read this. Uh, many times I myself have had this experience, the child is reading well beyond what is supposed to be in the class one textbook. And the teacher will tell the child, no, no, you should not be reading it. That is for me always a big surprise. How can we tell a child you should not or you cannot? The child is able to read. So that I see is something if we, if we, fall, if we think of these learning norms very rigidly, it leads us to this kind of funny situations rather than we actually understanding what the child is doing, right? And this theory does not explain how concept development takes place. It simply says that after a certain stage, the child will be capable of understanding certain concepts. How that change happens, this theory is not examining and it's therefore does not um, you know, comment on it or is silent on it. Uh, at this point, I would like to pause and see if there are some questions. I may not be able to take all of them, but if you put them in the chat box, that is fine. Or uh, if we can moderate, you could ask it. Right. Um, uh, Indira, there are some questions in the Q&A. Can I read it out? As a teacher, to huh. test the competencies of children, is it good to test the competencies based on the age of the learner huh. or the lo localities or the environment of the learner? Please suggest. Bhagya Lakshmi has asked this. Okay. Are there any similar questions? Should I take two, three at a go? Or I notice that four okay. parts. The second question. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll take them one by one. Uh, well, when you say testing a competency, you are actually using the behaviorist model. Uh, there's a particular outcome or skill that you we, we want to test the child. When you're talking age, you are also adding the maturation component. And finally, you are adding the social context of the component. Now, it's a difficult question to answer. You, the way you have asked it, it seems like we are expecting some predetermined outcome and we want to see whether the child is capable of doing that or not. I don't think there is a harm in doing that, provided we are open to the idea that the child is capable of learning much more regardless of its age or its social context and that is what we will come to the second half of the presentation, that through a process of uh, cognitively challenging interaction, the child can learn and be able to do many more things, which typically in constructivist approach, we do not define it as competency, but it's fine. I think we need to find a way of finding out what the child can be. And another, uh, constructivist called uh, Vygotsky uh, also said that the child can often be capable of doing much more when he is interacting either with a more uh, you know knowledgeable adult or child than what he is capable of doing by himself. So this is also he famously called it the zone of proximal development. So I have given you a complicated answer. I don't think there are any simple answers to the question. Thanks, Indira. The next question is around motivation, externally motivated. Okay. Uh, can't children be externally motivated? And please suggest methods to motivate learners externally so that they will be motivated internally in the wrong, long run. That's a lovely question, actually, in many ways. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think if... So the, the, there is an assumption that I make based on many years of observation of children and adults, uh, close to 40 years of observation, I would say, 
uh, that the act of understanding some something is itself motivating so people get interested when they start thinking about something when they are allowed to make some guesses or hypothesis and then when they get engaged in finding out if their guess or hypothesis is correct or testing it's a kind of you know you can say somewhat scientific uh, approach uh, i'm using it in a loose uh, sense um and that is very intrinsically motivating i think human beings like learning so if we make the learning process you know genuine where the learner is himself or herself is you know pursuing something that is of his interest then the need for what is called as external motivation comes down what we can do as teachers is provide that kind of environment in the classroom that we will come towards the end of the uh, you know uh, this presentation and hopefully we will discuss it more there is just one more question in the q and a yeah uh, and then we can continue the presentation yeah there are also uh, bindu just a minute about three or four participants have raised their hands would you want them to speak sure if yeah. uh, i have allowed them to talk they can yeah. uh, speak if they want to okay. murlidhar veena and uh, if you want to speak and ask a question please unmute and speak are these the same people who have typed in the questions no they are different okay yeah. so let me take the last question and then uh these three participants can take turns to ask their question so one is about shall we consider bloom's taxonomy mm. or a revised uh, taxonomy of anderson and catwall for the present scenario okay uh well simple answer is please do take a serious look at the revised uh, taxonomy uh, the taxonomy gives us a useful handle otherwise uh if you are i mean although i am inclined towards constructivism sometimes it can be a bit confusing about how do we organize learning for a child and therefore i would say please take a look at the revised taxonomy it has taken you know bloom did it many years ago so you must i think it is better to look at the revised taxonomy and think how that helps us to structure the curriculum i think in the chat we have a few questions uh, maybe if you want to take one more which is uh, what is the main cause for effectiveness learning in adolescent uh, children and the maturation period so uh, well i am i think i will not answer that question uh, adolescence itself is a, a special time according to some people and uh, it will take me a long time to answer that question and skip it right now sorry yeah okay and then i think you can continue and we'll take some more questions in the end okay thank you uh, apologies to the participants who had raised their hands please type in your questions so that bindu can collate them and you know if there are similar questions she can share it with me at the end thank you uh can we move to the next slide please yeah uh so now we come to what is a, a newer approach new in terms of historicity uh approach to learning which is constructivism and uh constructivism came about by the work of quite a few psychologists notably piaget among them but there are many others uh, and the question that they asked was i mean they did not necessarily say that behaviorism is not uh, correct or maturation does not happen but the question that was being explored is how do our mental structures or if you like if it's easier to understand how does the software in our head work you know what is it what's going on inside our minds and uh, that led to another deeper understanding and the focus is on cognitive development that is uh, 
there's some noise. Yeah. Yes, I muted. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And the focus is on cognitive development and deep understanding rather than on behavior or skills. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if a child does something, the interest is to know why the child did it and ask the child, you know, what made the child do it. Or in, in very young children to observe how a child tries to achieve a certain task. Um, in the paper that I shared with you, Fosnot describes how children were given the task of balancing a block on a fulcrum and how they went through what seemed to be random trial and error, but actually through the process, you can observe that the child is coming to some kinds of conclusion and basing and in the process of making those conclusions, the child is able to come to some idea and that idea we, is called reflective abstraction. Like if you put the block in the middle, then it can balance. So now the idea of middle, the idea that on both sides there must be, you know, the same thing, all these are reflective abstractions. And that can now help the child think about balance in the future. I mean, just balancing an object on a point. Uh, so that that's the kind of careful understanding that constructivism has brought into cognitive development. Uh, when stages are talked about, they are not understood as maturation in the biological sense, but thought to be constructions of active learners reorganization of mental structures. That is the learner himself or herself is having an idea, then when something happens in the world that does not match the idea, then the child um, can change the idea and the other uh, associated concepts. Um, just to, since we may not go into too much details, the, if what is happening outside matches the idea roughly to oversimplify it, uh, Piaget called this as assimilation. For example, let me give you a social example. If you think that a teacher is going to be angry with you and scold you, and uh, the, next, the teacher comes to class and does that, then the child is, the idea of the teacher which the child has is matched and the child assimilates. The child may extend this idea to anybody else. Oh. Hello, what happened? Hello. Excuse me. Indira, please unmute and continue. I've muted everyone. That, that was a scary noise. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I just gave that example not uh, it may not be true, but just to give you a sense of what it means. Uh, or for example, let me take a simpler example of assimilation. A child sees an animal with four legs and fur and a tail and her, her, hears someone say that's a dog. The child then after some time sees another animal with four legs and a tail and says dog. And then the adult with the child says no, that's a cat. Then the child has to, uh, you know, think about its idea of a dog and connect it to this other animal and understand why there are two categories of, uh, you know, animals. And that is when the child starts to do that and its idea about the animals are becoming more complicated, then that's a process through accommodation there are three or four ways in three ways in which accommodation can happen but basically the child is making more different and differentiated understanding of its experience right and uh, sometimes and, and and it won't be possible for me to extend the animal example um, the the experience and the ideas may not match at all, in which case there is a kind of 
uh, dissonance or disequilibrium and it makes us think very much and we try to understand what is going on why it's happened we, or two th things are behaving very differently and then we are puzzled and we have to think about it and reach a new level of understanding we have to change some ideas or reorganize old ideas and come to a new level of understanding and we reach another stage of equilibrium and we expect our new experiences will match according to again something else will happen right this happens to us all the time it's an on lifelong process because none of us have a perfect idea about the world not even einstein right so as the as our experience of with things changes our ideas also change and our mental structures change now this is very interesting right to give you an uh, comparison with the computers um, now computers are the software is programmed by a, 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 a human being which is not part of the machine now imagine if the computer could program itself so it can rewrite its own program based on some of the inputs and some of the outputs that are happening so it it is kind of a reflective cycle in fact nowadays i believe they are writing such kind of programs artificial intelligence and so on anyway let's not go into that but that is what our uh, we we are capable of you know our minds are so complicated that we are all the time revising and redoing what is our ideas about the world in an open ended manner and that is the way we are able to survive in the world around us which is changing right uh, i'll give you one more example i can't resist it uh, now this this virus that we are all so frightened about and which is why we are sitting like this you know instead of face to face now you take a virus now is a virus a living thing or is a virus not a living thing now it's it's it because once the virus is inside your body it seems to behave like a living thing it can multiply it can produce more of itself and so on and so forth and therefore you may say it is living like and a living infectious agent but take the virus in its pure form and put it in a bottle and it will sit there it is not capable of doing anything so then it behaves like a non living thing like a crystal almost so what are viruses are they living or are they non living or should we restructure our own ideas about what is living and what is non living and come to some other understanding about what is life itself right now so there are we, we can keep on going like this and thought and uh, you know our concepts keep changing right and a constructivism knows for example that learning is not sequential it can be it doesn't go step by step by step there are leaps and there are stasis stasis means period when we are very comfortable we know oh this is how the world is and by the world i mean everything the physical world the social world this is how people are this is how things are this is how you know families are it's a very kind of we are we think we understand everything then something happens which doesn't match our understanding right and then suddenly we are supposed to change and it may change a lot of things right a lot of understanding that we have had before right and so learning is not linear but it can it is in a very it happens in a very complicated uh, complex way the next thing that constructivism holds the next idea is that really we cannot separate knowledge and mind because both affect each other and by here here knowledge we also include cultural knowledge right all of us know about the world through language and language is a shared cultural uh, phenomena right so you know when you call why does why in our language do we have two different words for cat and dog that comes from culture but 
because we have two different words the child's mental structure has to change in order to match these that these two different words are there for four legged animals with hair and a tail right and which are quite friendly with humans so so the knowledge and the mental structure are both influencing each other and therefore you cannot separate knowledge from the mental structures that is a very strong assumption in constructivism luckily we are talking of psychological constructivism if we this were a philosophy class we would have hours of debate about this right uh, anyway we will not at this moment and learning is not based on development but learning itself is development you you develop because you learn learning and development are the same thing that is what uh, piaget says for example right the next important point is representation that is um think about it when i say think about it uh, for example if i say think about an elephant all right so what have i said you cannot even see me but you heard the word elephant and then in your mind you represented it to yourself as a particular animal with certain certain features i could also say draw an elephant right and then you would represent it in yet another way the word elephant itself is a representation of an animal okay now the, it is even a little more complicated than even that now if there was a real elephant in front of you and i say the word elephant the word elephant stands for that particular animal but it also stands for all other animals which are like this animal and therefore that is what is meant by representation right and representation is what allows us to do many things and you know symbolically act upon the world so now i'll continue with my elephant example now think of the word yellow right now you all of you have got the idea of what is yellow haladi uh, banna now you can't do it in real life but you can do it in your head imagine a yellow elephant wow so because we have representation we have a and we have this faculty of imagination we have been able to combine two things and create something which is probably does not exist in the world so but we can certainly imagine a yellow elephant and children will draw a yellow elephant with you know if you ask a child to draw they are they are happily able to do uh, many things just because they are using this mental faculty and the ability to represent so representation is one key process in the way we construct understanding or construct knowledge now um cognition and social change uh, representation cognition and social change are inherently connected so so our the way we represent something the way we understand something and the way we interact with society are all connected with each other uh we probably won't have time to go into the details of this but let me try and explain a little bit of what i mean here right so studies have shown that depending on how you rep the medium of representation for example instead of saying elephant i could say draw that animal i could say i could give you some uh, clay and say make that animal and i could say act like that animal now in each of these apparently a different facet of the animal is given emphasis a different facet of the experience is given emphasis so the way we represent also affects the way we understand the object and that's that's very interesting and the way we understand is cognition and the way we cognize something is culturally connected 
So like the word itself and all the meanings associated with word is given to us from culture. By culture, I mean the shared understanding that we have with each other. So if you go and tell somebody, I was walking on the jungle and I saw a yellow elephant and I got really frightened, people will get an idea of what you're talking about because all the words that you are talking about has a shared meaning with them. And the surprise of seeing a yellow elephant is also shared because all of us have an idea of what really an elephant looks like. So that's, I'm trying to give, make the last sentence a little clearer. Uh, shall we go to the next slide, please? Now, so that's why um, the role of representation in constructivist approach is very important. Like I explained, we humans use many different ways of representing experience. Symbol, language, storytelling, dance, drama, film, sculpture, meaning shilpi, uh, scientific models, mathematical forms. So there are so many ways of representing and all of that helps our cognitive understanding and creates knowledge. Now the way uh, 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 shilpi understands an elephant will be quite different from the way a zoologist understands an elephant, isn't it? It's because they are representing the elephant to themselves in two different ways. Um, and uh, that's the role of representation therefore becomes really important. Symbolic representation empowers us to go beyond the concrete, like I gave you the yellow elephant example, uh, cross cultural barriers and generate new possibilities. So we can, you know, um, when you hear someone do something which is quite different than what we uh, think is the normal way of doing something, then we can think, oh, that's also possible, right? Uh, when you see when you see a picture of, you know, a bus in China, which is being driven by a lady driver, it's say, oh, okay, it's interesting. Ladies can also drive buses. And so it changes, it generates new possibilities. I'm giving very simple examples that obviously the possibilities are much. So in this process, we assimilate, we ex I explained that, we accommodate, reach equilibrium temporarily as we construct reflective abstractions. So uh, to take the example of the lady bus driver, we may have a reflective abstraction that bus drivers are male, right? And therefore, without, uh, you know, we, we just have this assumption that if it's a driver, it must be a male. So someone tells you a, drive, a story about a bus driver, you picture in your mind a male driver. Till somewhere in the story, there's something that happens which surprises you and says that uh, the driver is a female. And then you have to change your mental constructions and your model and make a new reflective abstraction. Uh, again, like I said, this is a too simple, almost a silly example. But whatever, yeah. So, uh, and learning itself is a constructive building process of meaning making, which results in reflective abstractions produ producing symbols within a medium. So when you learn something and you express it through whatever medium, through language, through role play, through journal writing, through model making, through uh, diagrams, that is the way we share our understanding of our understanding here can be thought of as a reflective abstraction that is it's not the thing itself but a idea or a representation of that thing that we have produced and that is how learning is supposed to take place Whew, that's quite a bit can we go to the next slide yeah and uh, the cognitive studies show that the capacity to think, reason, and make sense of the uh, self and the world and to use language is intimately connected with acting and interacting, doing things by oneself and with others. The underline is on acting, interacting, doing. This is the way we come to understand the world, not by sitting in the, not by just listening to someone explain something that can help us understand a little bit, but it's only when we represent it, when we act it, when we try to see what are the possibilities that we come to a deeper understanding. 
Meaningful learning is a generative process of representing and manipulating concrete things and mental representations rather than storage and retrieval of information. So I'll come back to my favorite, you know, uh, yellow ele elephant. Now, if someone, if you knew yellow simply as the right answer to the question, what is the color of the sun? And you knew elephant simply as the right answer to the question of what, what is the elephant that is found in the jungle which has a tusk, then, you know, it's, it's a kind of inert knowledge. It has a fixed uh, response to a fixed question, a predetermined behavior, if you like. And we might think that is correct. But we are not able to do anything creative with these two ideas, right? It's a creative process, which is, which is important. So this generative process means you can combine these two ideas, right? Of yellow and elephant and produce a yellow elephant. In fact, humans are fantastically creative. You just have to wait till, you know, the Gauri Ganesha festival and you will see Ganesha riding a car, Ganesha playing the guitar, Ganesha with the computer. So people are putting these ideas, you know, even the idea of Ganesha itself is a generative idea. You combine an elephant and a human. Nature doesn't seem to do that. But we, because we have these reflective abstractions, we are able to combine the idea of an elephant and a human being and produce Ganesha, right? So it's a very creative, generative process. That's what you should keep in mind. And that is what makes it exciting, intrinsically motivating, right? Not to give a fixed answer to a textbook or a question, textbook question. That is not interesting. That is not motivating. At least I think so. Unless, of course, the textbook is selling you something new. So this child who is curious much before the teacher teaches the textbook, would have sat and read the pages of the textbook because she's interested in what something new the textbook is telling us. Uh, sadly, we, we destroy that curiosity in the class. I'm sorry if I hurt anybody. So conceptual development is, keeps on happening, a continuous process of deepening and enriching connections and acquiring new layers of meaning. So it, is, it, this is not, uh, it doesn't stop. You keep thinking, keep finding out, and that's what I think keeps us alive. It really keeps us alive. It's true that, you know, Einstein might be thinking of gravity and uh, photons and so on. We might be thinking of why is, you know, why are workers suffering so much? Why are they, you know, in such a bad shape today, not being able to go home? Why is politics not, uh, you know, why are politics doing what they are doing? So, but you know, whichever field we are interested in, we are thinking and finding out more, right? So if, so it depends on the question we ask. And that is something which I think is the source of internal motivation. However, it is not completely individualistic, right? You get motivated when you talk to someone, someone gives you an explanation. I think this, uh, this new economic package is going to you know, you hear two neighbors talking. I'm giving again everyday examples. Uh, to the, the new package that has been announced is going to do something very good. The other person says, no, no, it is absolutely useless. It is not going to do, it is going to lead us to more disaster. And then you start thinking, uh -huh, how do we understand it? What does economics say? What does, you know, what do uh, people who understand this a little more say? And then you start thinking and you get new ideas and then you are able to come to some conclusion or you may not be able to come to some conclusion because we are still in this disequilibrium, but we are trying to get new ideas about it, right? So that's what I meant that you keep on learning and not just children, but we ourselves. I think we are almost towards the end. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, Okay, I think we'll skip that. It's been covered. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so this is really the uh, last two slides. Um, uh, that uh, So if, I mean, since the way we learn is to ask questions and get curious and think and do, that's what we should encourage students to do. That's the first point. Yeah, and tell them, Try it, do it, find out why it happens, see what you can do. Children do this naturally. Um, and if we should encourage it in our classroom. And 
errors. The second point is mistake should be seen as resulting from learner's conceptions and not minimized or avoided. There is, in fact, at this point, I would like to introduce this really, really lovely book. Uh, I don't know if I should turn on the video at this point, but I'll tell you the name of the book. The book is called The Reflective Learner, Seeing Missed Takes in Mistakes, compiled and edited by Neeraja Raghavan. So it's an excellent book where teachers have used children to learn from their mistakes. And I would really encourage you to read it. Um, allowing reflection time through journal writing, uh, representation in different ways, and which will help reflective abstraction. Classrooms should foster discussion and dialogue. Don't sh shut children up, allow them to talk and talk in meaningful ways. If they are excited about what you're teaching them, they will be, ha they will be interested to talk about it. Uh, as the end of 2005 says, the curriculum must enable children to find their voices, nurture their curiosity, to do things, to ask questions, and to pursue investigations, sharing and integrating their experience with school knowledge, rather than their ability to reproduce textual knowledge. Uh, the uh, 2005 document also has an excellent section on how you can make assessment. Somebody already asked the question of how do you assess? So open-ended question. You don't have a fixed answer, but it allows you to get an idea of how the child is thinking. Uh, I think that's the last slide. Can you just check? Ah, so that's just the conclusion. I'll read you, let you read it by yourself. Now, or to emphasize constructivism is a psychological theory. It sees learning as making understanding, making sense, interpreting, and it's not a linear step-by-step -step process. Learners sometimes can make jumps, uh, you know, uh, when they are very excited and interested about something. And when we talk of surroundings, it means both physical and social. It's based on evolution and development models. And for us as educators, it's a challenge to see how we can use this, what knowledge is coming from cognitive studies and how we can translate it into our work as teachers. That is the, you know, um, challenge before us. It's still early days, but it's quite exciting when you think of how things can happen. Uh, what research is telling us. Uh, thank you. Next slide is the thank you slide. Uh, we have some time for q and I don't know if we can over. Um, I think Ma Maitli has answered a few questions on the chat, uh, Indra. Very I good. Look at, I look at some of them. Um, yeah. Children think divergently in so many other things, but less so in academics. What is the solution that you would suggest for this? <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> I've spent much of my lifetime pondering about this question. Uh, I think academics needs to just forget that it's academics and be with the children and see how they are curious and how they talk about things and how we can extend their thinking about something. Um, yeah, let me give you a very quick example. So this uh, recently, the, a five-year-old child was being taught, uh, the, you know, what is living. And she asked this question, uh, when the tooth is inside the mouth, is it living? And when I take it out, and you know, in, in some cultures, when the tooth falls, you put it under the pillow, next day, you're supposed to find some money in, under your pillow. So if I keep it under the pillow, is the tooth still alive? Now that's shows that the child is trying to understand what, how we distinguish something that is alive. The same child asked, uh, a person is alive. What about the photograph of the person? Is that also alive? 
Now, it's, it's interesting to see how children are trying to make sense of what we are telling them. And living and non-living is something we teach in classrooms. Uh, and, uh, you know, how to make, uh, keep this curiosity of the children alive. I will give you, uh, uh, if you look at the Homo Baba textbook, small science it is called, it's wonderful. I think that textbook will spark off this kind of thinking among children. So just take a look at that textbook time. It's available on the net. Yeah. Um, um, okay, Indra, I think that's all we have time for. It's 12 o'clock. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, Maitli, would you like to... Uh, thank you very much, Indira, for this uh, insightful uh, session. Sakashta questions are bandi the Q and A naale na wo nim ke amal kalus korti vi ni the. Vito responses kalus sadre adhen na collect maadi na wo group al hakti vi. So you and the other question matra chantal bala interesting a gitto na no I couldn't resist myself na no tera korti dunia dikhe. Yeah, so the other questions, if you could please uh, respond, we can uh, share it uh, with the group. So, so thank you all very much. Yeah, just to clarify, Mantili, you want me to respond to the questions offline? Is that what you're saying? Uh, if it is uh, uh, possible for you. Sure. So there are sure. at least 15 questions in the Q&A box, uh, yeah. and uh, some of them are uh, very interesting. So, so I only answered the uh, ones uh, in the chat box because we will lose them. Adadmen namge sigala prashne gala. Q and A na liro dinna na wo collect maadi nimge kalis kordi. Ah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you, participant. It's been a bit one-sided. Uh, maybe it's because of this medium. I don't know. Uh, I will be working on how to make presentations more interactive. Thank you all. Thank you, Maithili Bindu. Uh, for inviting me and for supporting me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Indira. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, we will see you next week again.